Previously, we talked about how the call stack can give recursion capabilities that you don't get from standard loops. But the function that we demonstrated this with only called itself once. And the real power for recursion comes in when the function calls itself more than once. And this is a uh, behavior that I will refer to as branching recursion. And you'll see why I call it this here shortly. So probably the most standard example of recursion of this form is the Fibonacci numbers. So not to break with tradition, we will create a uh, Fibonacci sequence recursively. The idea of the Fibonacci numbers is that they start off 1, 1, and then every subsequent number is the sum of the previous two. So the next number is a 2, the next number is a 3, and then a 5, and then an 8, and a 13, etc. We can calculate this recursively with a little function. We'll call it fib. And we will calculate the nth Fibonacci number, where n is an integer, and it will give us back an integer. If n is less than 2, because here, so I'm saying this is 1, uh, this is 0, this is 1, so that's 2. If it's anything less than that, we're going to give back a 1. Else, we are going to calculate the two previous Fibonacci numbers and add them together. So that would be fib of n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2. Okay, so that should define a function to calculate Fibonacci numbers. Let's try it out. We'll load that in. Fib of, well, 2 should give us 2. 3 should give us 3. 4 is 5. 5 is 8. 6 is 13. We'll put a slightly larger number in there. Okay, so this calculates Fibonacci numbers. But in some ways, what we care about is not that it calculates Fibonacci numbers, because we could calculate them in other ways. What we care about is how this function works, this branching recursion. Because this function calls itself not once, but twice. And that is something that you cannot reproduce easily with loops. So when we call this function, what actually happens? Well, I'm going to go through a fairly s small example here. Let's say we're going to call this function with the value 4. And I'm going to dispense with saying fib of 4 and just give the argument that varies here. Well, what happens in this case? It checks. Is 4 less than 2? No, it's not. So, in fact, I'm going to do this in two different ways. We're going to have a 4 there. And then we're also going to have a 4 over here. And this one will be for the call stack itself. Okay. So when we call the function with 4, because 4 is not less than 2, it calls itself with n minus 1, which would be 3. And so over here, I'm going to draw in, actually, let's do it this way. Put in a 3. And we'll draw one of our nice little arrows to show us that this was a function call. <laughs> I don't think I want my arrow to quite do that. There we go. That'll work nicely. OK, so 4 called 3. What happens in 3? Well, back over here on the stack, 3 is not less than 2 either. So 3 goes in, and it calls itself first at with n minus 1, which means that it makes a recursive call on 2. Okay, let's go ahead and let's add that in here. Two. And that call comes from the one with three. Okay. What happens there? Well, two is also not less than two, so this calls itself with one. And we can put that over here. We have a 1. Now, fortunately, the 1 is less than 2. 
So this branch of the recursion is now done. Okay, four called three called two called one, and this passes back the value one. But if we go and we look at our function again, what is happening? Well, that was this call right here. It still needs to do this call. And so, now on the stack, the call from one returns, it gave back a value of one. And the call with two now has another call that has to happen, and it calls itself with zero. And over here, we're gonna draw that in this way. And now you can probably see why I refer to this as branching recursion, because the calls are basically branching out. Now, of course, the stack doesn't. The stack is just going to go down and back up and then down and back up. But the branches happen by things going up and then back down. The zero is less than two, so that immediately returns one. The two now, we've calculated a one and a one, and we add them, and we return back from there. The call from three, it has done the call to two, but now it's sitting there waiting for a call for n minus two, which would be one. So let's go ahead and let's put in this other recursive call here. So three also calls itself, calls the function with one. One is less than two, so that immediately returns back here. I guess our stack regrew, it had a one on it. That immediately returns. This gave us a two, this gave us a one. They're added together and we get a value of three going back to here. But now the four is also still waiting. It finished the three call, but that needs to be added to another recursive call. So the three has returned, but now we need to make a recursive call with two. And two is not less than two, so the first thing it does, it makes a recursive call with one. And one here, one is less than one, so it immediately returns a one. The two is then sitting there and waiting, it has the one that came back, and now it needs to call itself with zero. So here, in our picture, we get a call with zero. That immediately returns one. The two now got a one from one call and a one from the other call, it adds them up, and it returns two back to here. This has now completed. We got three from one of the, for the first call and two from the second recursive call and so it is able to add them together and it gives back five and the whole thing pops off of our stack and the stack is now, well, back up to whatever had called our recursive function in the first place. This shows you why I call this branching recursion because we are, what's literally happening with the stack is it's going down and then popping back up and then coming down and popping back up and going down, but we can visualize it as these calls are branching out and when you trace these functions, this is how I recommend that you do it. I recommend that you look at what's happening by drawing out a branching diagram like this. Now in the case of Fibonacci, this really isn't an efficient way to do the calculation because we repeat a lot of work. This subtree here with a two is the same as this subtree here with a two. If we had had a five up here, the whole three subtree would have been duplicated twice, etc. So turns out there are better ways to calculate Fibonacci numbers, but they're a good example of how this branching recursion works and how it is able to kind of try multiple options. It's able to go down the three option and then because the stack remembers things, it's able to go down and do the two option. And we'll see several more examples of that uh, going through this playlist.